street level. And if we walk over here now into the wall, we've made a special arrangement so that one can look out through plate glass picture windows and not only see the traffic going by, but the part of ancient London spread out there before us. Well, the Museum of London, although very big, is really like most site museums. In other words, it is the material from the archaeological site alongside it. And when you look out through this window, you see the walls which are on the alignment of what was the west wall of the Roman fort, the Roman Cripplegate fort, and of course later incorporated in the city wall, both in Roman and medieval times. The bastion that you can see um, is in fact almost certainly a medieval one, and indeed much of the brickwork is quite obviously 18th or 19th century brickwork on the, own, on the original line. I think it's fair to say that this arrangement, as you see it now, is an interim one, uh, pending getting real resources available to lay this out and show much more of the Roman and medieval features than you can see at the moment. Also, perhaps one could add that just outside the museum and in a chamber beneath which the traffic is now roaring along London Wall is the remains of the west gate of the Cripplegate Fort, and that can be seen by arrangement there. Um, as one leaves the Roman gallery, of course, you move into a period which, or about which, of course, rather less is known, the period which we call the Dark Age of London. Uh, the public can see here some of the material associated with Saxon invaders coming into the London basin, uh, none of it, of course, very close to London, mostly about 10 miles or so away. And coming out of that, the story picks up again with the London of Alfred and a great increase in the richness of materials. Yes, for example, what sort of material have you got from Alfred's time? Well, perhaps we could go a bit later than Alfred and, and show one of our finest pieces, which is the Viking tombstone from St. Paul's, uh, a rather inspired piece of uh, relief carving uh, with the name of the person buried uh, on the edge. That's the stone just in front of us that we've arrived at. That's right. It appears to have a lion or dragon and snake intertwined with each other. In fact, that's shortly to go into the big Viking exhibition at the British Museum and the Metropolitan in New York. Those axes in that case there, they're from... They're Viking period ones from London, uh, many of them from the river, and therefore not with very accurate fine spots, but nevertheless indicative perhaps of the times. The Viking threat can be imagined from the keen edge of those Norsemen's axe heads. But another serious threat to London, to its history at least, occurred in very recent times. Post-war building development and the rate at which buildings were going up during those building boom years of the 60s and early 70s. From this it was clear that the hidden history of the city lying just below the Victorian basements was being lost forever and at an alarming speed. The Museum of London therefore set up a department of urban archaeology to rescue as best it could what archaeology was left. The director of this unit, Brian Hobley, faced an almost impossible task. During the late 60s and the early 70s, of course, the developer was having a boom time and the sort of Manhattan-type skyline that you see around us today, in fact, was started at that time. And huge sites covering many acres, in fact, were going uh, in a few short months. And the Guildhall Museum at that time had only um, one assistant and uh, no excavation team at all. So what sort of sites do you think were lost? Well, sites of all the periods, um, Roman, Saxon, and me medieval. But it was the scale of the destruction that was frightening, and of course, was the catalyst in the end to the production of the Future of London's Past, the book by Martin Middle, and the large team that we have working today. Today, the team has anything up to 100 people working at any one time, from excavators patiently troweling away at layers of city soil, to specialists, scientists, and research students applying their skills and knowledge to interpret what's been recovered. John Schofield, for instance, is in charge of the unit's field archaeology. He's an environmentalist. And on the Thames Bank, by the Customs House in the Pool of London, he recalled what they've been doing along the waterfront. Over the last five years, we've dug at eight or nine sites on the waterfront. We found that in the Roman period, there was a substantial uh, and clearly um, imperially planned key of timber stretching from the Custom House, just uh, above us here, to the mouth of the Warbrook, now beneath Cannon Street Station, where it probably formed part of the riverside aspect of the Governor's Palace. How big a key was this? It stood about two meters high and was made of 
oak beams, some up to 28 feet long, laid in a key wall. This was braced back into the foreshore with various systems of braces and piles, which may well have supported quayside buildings or possibly even cranes. So it was a very big installation. It was a, a big building project. Yes, it must have been uh, designed and uh, decided upon by the Imperial administration as some kind of uh, fillet to London's trading position. The timber that was used uh, was oak, you were saying. Huge pieces of oak that presumably had to be floated down the Thames. Yes, the amount of oak used for it just cannot be computed. We presume that this oak was felled somewhere up the Thames and floated down in, in great rafts like Canadian lumberjacks uh, and laid on the shore, prefabricated the joints, worked out, and the whole thing clicked together. We're certainly looking at what must have been a great second or third century attempt to underline London's uh, importance as the entry to the province, um, a system of civic or imperial schemes which go with the building of the Great Wall in the early third century. I myself think it, it preceded this. I like the idea of the uh, mid to late second century for um, some kind of imperial stamp of approval that London was really on its way to becoming a great city. You've got an ideal place here, haven't you, with uh, waterlogged conditions so that all sorts of things might survive. Yes, predominantly seeds. We have, uh, I think, on the waterfront, uh, Britain's earliest cucumber seed. Um, it's also clear, for instance, that um, during the Saxon period, when the Roman key was in decay, that somebody came and uh, shelled a packet of walnuts on the beach. Um, these are <laughs> incidental uh, results are so far coming through. But as well as the Roman waterfront, you've had a wonderful opportunity to, to look at various periods. And I wonder what the medieval picture is beginning to look like. The Roman Quay is just south of Upper and Lower Thames Street, that is 80 yards behind the present river wall. And the intervening distance, we now know, was, is the result of land reclamation in the late Saxon and medieval periods, 80 yards of it. They reclaimed the land by building a revetment on the foreshore in front of the previous one and uh, filling the intervening space with domestic rubbish. And this again is waterlogged and has given us many thousands of medieval objects, pilgrim badges, uh, dagger sheaths, jerkins, shoes, and objects of bone and wood. Um, and so the, the north bank of the Thames was consolidated and did gradually push the river over very, very slowly. And because there was little municipal control, the river frontage must have, uh, we called it indented. It was um, higgledy-piggledy, and the, the wharves were out at different lengths along the foreshore. So it must have looked very packed throughout most of its medieval life. We've come onto a site now which is just off Thames Street, uh, two or three hundred yards back from the bank of the Thames, and we've come down into a development site and we seem to be down amongst Victorian basements. Uh, is that just about where we've landed up, Brian? Yes, there's certainly evidence of Victorian buildings above us, but in fact what you're looking at now is the a cellar of a building which stood here in the Great Fire of London. If you look to the left here, you can see part of the cellar wall with a buttress-like arrangement projecting out. And do notice the, the, the brickwork there, how on the outer face it is fired, you know, brilliantly red and shattered from the intensity of the fire in 1666. And that projection, in fact, was part of the support for the joists orange and this comes from the daub of the timber frame walls built in the late in the first century and second century but a carbonized intensely black level like this is a thing in such sort of dramatic circumstances as this i mean it doesn't require the eye of faith for or even you to see this it is vividly demonstrated in front of us now and as i say the quality of the excavation records all these fine details which i think are are highly charged with the sort of human element, uh, you know, of the events that took place on that fearful occasion. Um, we're working seven days a week, and we're doing this right through the winter, but we've got much deeper to go um, yet, getting through to the, uh, the first century levels, because what we're standing above now, some two to three meters, we're standing above the primary river bank of the River Thames, the objective here is to examine that primary riverbank for the first evidence of 
the utilization of it for the mooring of ships in the in the first century by the Romans. We know in fact there should be revetments here and terracing upon which the boats could be moored. Um, in addition to that, we need to know as the river in, in fact moves further south due to the building of these revetments um, and the dumping of rubbish in front, we need to know about the later Roman occupation of course, but also very important, the, the Saxon usage on this site and of course um, hopefully picking up some um, tenement boundaries coming off from Pudding Lane and Thames Street. I've come down out of the busy London streets now and I've come down a flight of stairs into a basement where there's an archaeological site. It's hardly recognizable as a basement anymore because great trenches are appearing. Uh, right through the whole cellar complex of this building. And in charge of it all is the site supervisor, Dominic Perrin. Presumably this building was about to be demolished, Dominic, and you're in here uh, digging away before the contractors move in. Yes, we have until next January to sort out what's going on. And why did you choose this particular cellar? Well, because we were digging last year for six months on the Watling Court site, where we found a sequence of Roman buildings, and we're now looking at the frontage from which those buildings were extending. Ah, so you're working at the back of these buildings that you're now beginning to discover here in this basement? Yes, and of course the advantage of working here is that we can now see the earliest parts of those buildings because they're closest to the road and therefore understand more fully the date at which the plan of this part of the city was established. Now, are we down to the Roman levels here? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're in a Victorian basement, I suppose. Yes. Well, as you can see, about uh, three, four foot beneath the level of the Victorian concrete slab, we have these distinctive uh, yellow and red layers coming up. These are associated with Roman buildings, and you can see the scorching levels where these buildings were destroyed by a fire now, in the early 2nd century. Where is that? Sure. If you look just beyond where Marie and Peter are working over here, you can see behind Peter, the, if Peter would point, yes. there you, go, you can see some scorching down there. Oh, it's yes. just, just visible of the fire debris. You can also pick it up in one or two places and you can see perhaps just past the ladder over there. Mm -hmm. Now this was the fire from when? This is the so-called Hadrianic fire, which is of the early 2nd century, about 120s to 130s. And we found evidence of that on a number of sites in the city. A uh, natural fire, much as the Great Fire of 1666. And that gives us a nice horizon, which we can relate to various other sites we've dug in the last few years. Now you were pointing out a Roman road. Yes, indeed. And if you look, you can see the camber through here, just beneath our shoring along there, you can see the camber, perhaps. And we've got about five metres of the road so far exposed in width. Is this basement proving to be as rewarding as you hoped? Unfortunately, in terms of our time, it's proved far more exciting because we have a lot of Saxon structural activity also on site. And we're now able to look at the Saxon buildings, which front onto Bow Lane, the modern equivalent of the Roman road we've got in this trench meeting in front of us. Mm. And if we go next door, perhaps we can look at some of these. Mm. Were the Saxon buildings a surprise, then? Yeah, you, you go first and I'll follow. Right. Not a total surprise, in that we know that Bow Lane is a fairly old frontage, because we have two Saxon churches on it. And we also know this earlier Roman road beneath it. But it was a surprise in that we'd feared that most of these sorts of levels had been completely cellared away by the Victorians. And it's very rare in London that we had a chance to look at levels of this date because of this later selling I mentioned. Well, we've come into another room and uh, you've lifted the cellar floor to the depth of three or four feet. And uh, there are one or two features there. This extremely unexciting black stuff is very typical of the Saxon period. If you look carefully between the black, you can see occasional thin bands of lighter coloured material. Yes. And if you can look just down there, between these two Victorian trenches, you can see some light, ashy type material. Yes, In yes. fact, this is a sort of sand and appears to be associated with the floor surfaces within these Saxon buildings. It's fairly characteristic, and in fact, we have two or three such levels visible on the site. Uh, again, if you go back to towards near where John is standing, you can perhaps see some slightly graveled materials. These are the fairly hard, packed floor surfaces, presumably inside a Saxon building. <laughs> These would be timber buildings, and of course, you wouldn't see very much obvious of them today, in that the timbers have been rotted away or robbed out for reuse. Stood. And inside, these sandy type floor surfaces. Are you getting any artifacts out of these things? It's very early days as yet. We've only opened up this area in the last few days, but we're already producing several shares of Saxon pottery, fairly coarse, shelly, uh, shell tempered pottery. Uh, fairly different from the Roman material we're getting next door, where we have some very nice pottery, some fairly glamorous, same, with interesting patterns and decorations. So you're doing pretty well. In this Victorian basement, you've got a Roman robe, 
uh, evidence of an early Roman fire that destroyed Roman London. And now you've got these Saxon houses. Uh, are there any other goodies to come out of this basement? Well, it really would be horrible to have to guess. Every time we've dug a hole, we've managed to find something so far. If we go on at this rate, we'll be here for five years, and unfortunately the developers would like to have been sooner. But what about later material? Anything medieval? We do have several chalk-founded walls of the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, these are fairly attractive, deep-founded walls. Uh, unfortunately, no building plans, because it's a very small scale for the operations down here. So what's all this end up to? Well, it's giving us a very fascinating picture of this part of the Roman London and Saxon London, but most importantly, we're able to look at the shift in emphasis from a Roman road to a Saxon road, and we're looking at the latest Roman activity from the one road to the Jason road. And by seeing when the shifts occur and how and why they occur, we can perhaps understand a lot more about the nature of Roman London at the time and the re-establishment of London in the late Saxon. We've come down to a development site now on the edge of the city, just off Fenchurch Street, and somewhere between Allgate and the Tower. And it's a huge demolition site where contractors have moved in, cleared away an old building here, and are now digging down perhaps 20 or 30 feet. But the exciting thing that's happened is that part of the original Roman wall has been exposed. And the site supervisor here, John Maloney, is standing here with me in front of this thing, admiring it. <laughs> How much of this wall is left, John? About 10 feet? Yes, we have uh, a section of it here that's 10 feet high and 20 feet in length. Mm. Um, it's preserved from the plinth to the third course of uh, Roman tiles. So we're actually standing at Roman ground level here? Yes, we are. We're actually on the contemporary surface um, that existed here when the wall was built around the year 200. Yes. Did you realise that this wall was going to turn up on this site? We didn't think we'd be as lucky um, as we were in finding this very impressive length of it. We did have some clues, however. When we got here, um, we found that these two bays that we're looking at, arch bays, were completely plastered over with white mortar, and we could see the outlines of bricks coming through the mortar, but nevertheless, we did strip some of the mortar off the wall 